Great. Thank you all for joining us um, for our collective mentoring webinar series. We're glad that you're here today. Peer mentoring considerations and best practices. All right, our, uh, we want to give thanks to um, our 2019 Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series planning team. And it's funded by our Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention and through the National Mentoring Resource Center and facilitated in partnership with Mentor, the National Mentoring Partnership. All right, some good things to know. Uh, one week after the webinar, all attendees will receive an email with instructions for how to access a PDF of all presentation slides and a webinar recording. There will also be a link to the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series webpage where all slides, recordings, and resources are posted. Please help us out by answering our survey questions at the end of the webinar. So you can actually participate in today's webinar. Um, all attendees are muted for best sound. Type your questions and comments in the question box, and please try to respond to our polls. Um, for example, we have one today. Who is with us? So what is your experience level in the mentoring field? Great, we have um, oh, quite a bit of a spread. We have quite a bit of people who are experienced in the mentoring field and a few beginners with us today. We hope that you all can take something away from today's webinar. This next poll is what is your role in the mentoring field? Please select one. Right, next slide. All right, glad to be here today. Um, like I said, again, I'm Desiree Robertson, Director of Training and Product Design for Mentor. So we can go ahead and move to the next slide. So we introduce our very first uh, panelist. We have Josh Berger with us. He is a Director of Belgium Center for Innovative Leadership in Los Angeles, California, author of the National Mentor and Resource Center Review on Cross-Age Peer Mentoring, and mentoring consultant currently working with the San Francisco's Mayor's Office on Youth Mentoring and Economic Mobility in Affordable Housing Communities. Welcome, uh, Josh, and I will turn it on over to you. And I'll just go ahead and actually uh, introduce our other panelist, who is Margo Ross. Uh, she is the Managing Director and Communications and Development Center for the Center of Supportive Schools and oversees CSS business development efforts, including grant writing, grant management, communications, and marketing. 
And our third uh, set of panelists are going to be from Western High School and Baltimore City Public Schools, Anitra Washington and Regatta Dalio. Um, she is our actually peer uh, panelist that's on the uh, webinar today. So, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Desiree, for having me on the call on this webinar. I'm really excited with the great work that Mentor does, and I'm uh, looking forward to hearing from the Center for Supportive Schools. Uh, I'm Josh Berger, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, best practices for implementing peer mentoring programs, school-based or community-based. And I'm going to move quickly through the slides here, but I know that you'll have a chance to reference it later if you're interested in seeing it. Uh, just to make sure we're on the same page to start, as we look at defining peer mentoring, we're really talking about a systematic approach to delivering mentoring services through the use of trained peers. And I just want to emphasize, anytime we talk about a mentoring program, we're really focused on the relationship as um, you know, the, the primary, uh, primary importance uh, for the program. So unlike a peer tutoring program or a peer education program or a peer mediation program, when we talk about peer mentoring, we're looking for those that are focused on the relationship between the mentor and the mentee. Uh, Professor Michael Carter has some great work on this that I recommend looking into as well if you're interested. Uh, when asking why peer mentoring, uh, some studies really suggest that there is no significant statistical differences in outcomes whether the mentor is an adult or a teenage peer. And in fact, sometimes given the power of peer influence, there can be opportunities for youth to have an even greater impact because there can be a trust there and a relatability there that can be super helpful in developing mentoring programs. So it provides a really economical way to reach widespread populations of youth, and there are many benefits to peer mentoring programs. So when implemented effectively, we see some of those benefits as uh, leading to increases in school connectedness, uh, academic and social emotional development, uh, enhancing diversity and inclusion initiatives, uh, increase in communication skills and leadership skills, self esteem, uh, and then some decreases in disciplinary referrals or stress for mentees. And so, overall, there's the potential for uh, benefits for both the mentors and the mentees that are participating. Uh, and with that said, there are some limitations of peer mentoring programs that I think are good to keep in mind as they're getting launched or enhanced. Uh, one of those being that you know, peers often have some of the same uh, identity-related issues as their mentees might be having. And so particularly for a peer that's in, in crisis, it, it could be challenging to have the emotional space to be available from a mentoring standpoint. There are also at times unintended consequences to these programs where maybe some peers are modeling behaviors that aren't totally in line with the goals of the program. Uh, and I'll talk later about the fact that, you know, peers are not trained counselors, just as older mentors are not trained counselors. And so they really need to keep that in mind during the, the training portion of the program uh, so they know when they can hand something off that's beyond their ability to, to work with. Uh, in terms of evidence-based practices, Mentor does a great job of showing us that high-quality mentoring programs have positive effects on youth, and low-quality mentoring programs can actually potentially have documented damage to youth, which is one of the reasons why we're so committed to trying to provide uh, you know, the absolute best practices for implementing these programs so they can reach their full potential. And today I'll talk about some of those implementation factors based on the literature review for cross-age peer mentoring, and then also my uh, doctoral study, which was on the successes, challenges, and solutions for implementing these types of programs, where I heard from about 623 program coordinators across the country in a survey form and had 13 expert interviews or so from those that are either publishing in the field or who have um, trained, let's say, over a 1,000 program coordinators themselves. Uh, when we talk about the primary implementation factors, the four that I'm going to highlight today are program coordinators, peer mentors, program structure, and community or school support. So just in talking about program coordinators for a moment, in listening to the feedback from the study that I completed, a lot of them talk about how it's just the most rewarding experience that they're having in the school that they're working in or the community-based organization. They, they love it. They've done it for 15 years, 20 years, 5 years, 10 years, 
really a range, but that they would never want to give it up. And so I just want to say it's something that a lot of people that are connected to really appreciate and enjoy. That being said, there were numerous times when I had heard that there was a top-down decision either at a district level or a school-based level where someone got assigned and the issue was that they really didn't have a genuine passion for the program. And when that happens, a lot of times there is negative impact going forward. Uh, as far as having sufficient time to coordinate a mentoring program, that is uh, essential for the program to be successful. We find that the number one challenge reported by program coordinators is that they don't have the time to make all of the matches they need to make to follow up on them to provide the training. So hopefully there's a way in which you're going to be able to, when running these programs, uh, have sufficient time to dedicate to them. Another uh, challenge for program coordinator sustainability uh, has to do with the fact that sometimes these coordinators are within a school or a community-based organization, and then they end up leaving, and they have specialized knowledge that no one else in the community has with regards to that program. And so the program, which was actually running pretty effectively, ends up going away because they were the only person in the community that knew about it. Um, so we really recommend having stakeholder teams, having backup coordinators or co-coordinators with clearly defined roles so that you're able to, if someone is to move on, the program can continue on in the community that it's in. As far as peer mentors go, we'd recommend that there's uh, both a, like a, an empathy and a seriousness and a playfulness that peer mentors have. You want them to be able to be vulnerable and to connect with youth in those moments when they're really opening up to them. Uh, and then also to have a more playful side. That's one of the advantages of the cross-age peer mentoring structure is that there's a relatability and there's a connection that can form through that. Uh, you also need someone who's willing to work closely with adults. It's really a team between the program coordinator and the peer mentor and the peer mentee. So you need to have mentors who are able to so yes, they want to go to the training, they want to be part of a group of peer mentors, and they're really willing to work closely with and connect with those adults. Uh, in terms of uh, recommendations for recruitment and selection, uh, this is a great time to form that stakeholder committee and to get those recommendations from current peer mentors or from teachers or staff, coaches, uh, and it can be a good public relations uh, aspect for your program because by uh, community members participating in the selection process, they're going to get to know more about the strengths for what it's really offering. And we'd recommend selecting a group that is a microcosm of the community. Right? You don't want to pick a pre-existing group, like in a school, you don't want to just pick student council or those that are on an honor roll or something like that. Right? We want the mentees to be able to look up at the array of peer mentors and be able to relate and connect and identify from an interest standpoint, from a background standpoint. So it really should deserve its own selection process. Uh, in terms of training, we know that mentor training is absolutely essential. We can see a regression in mentees when there's not training. And we tend to divide it between pre-match training and post-match training. Uh, for pre-match training, if you can start with some sort of retreat or extended time period, it's a great way to start off the year. Uh, and when looking at the topics that are, that are most important to cover in that initial training, uh, from a skill building standpoint, the four at the bottom of the slide, active listening, confidentiality, referral skills, and equity and inclusion training are really vital to cover uh, right from the beginning. And just to briefly touch on a couple of them, clearly you need confidentiality to build the trust in the relationship, right? We don't the mentees are not going to feel comfortable opening up if somehow their mentors are spreading all this information about them throughout a school or community-based organization. And that being said, there needs to be an understanding that if there's a concern about personal health or safety for the mentees, that the peer mentors are really comfortable going to the program coordinator and breaking confidentiality and sharing that information. And they can share that, that they're going to do that with the mentees from the beginning what we don't want is a situation where peers are walking around as the only ones who have information that could be concerning about their mentee. So we really work on that in training, practicing that referral process, brainstorming what that looks like. And it doesn't happen all the time, but in the instances where it does come up, 
were really pleased that we took that time in the training to make sure that they felt comfortable doing it. Uh, additionally, for pre-match training, we talk about, from an expectation standpoint, you know, mentors need to show up, right? The research says that being there makes a difference and not being there makes a difference. So sometimes the mentors can't make it because they're busy or they need to cancel and they're just torn in different directions and they don't think much of it. But from a mentee standpoint, it can feel like they're not a priority uh, or there's some way in which they didn't feel as connected. And particularly if they have other relationships in their lives where this has taken place, that can be triggering. So we want to make sure that the mentors know the, the importance of being there on a consistent basis. I also like to make sure we're sharing realistic expectations during the pre-match training with our mentors. Uh, you know, one of the coordinators in my study talked about how sometimes we talk about the unicorn and the rainbow version of what the mentoring relationship can look like. And if the expectations get too high on the part of the mentors, then when there's challenges or obstacles or things don't go as anticipated, they can uh, become a little bit deflated and maybe even drop out of the program, which could lead to early match termination, which we know has a negative impact on the mentees. So it's good to think through what do some of those challenges look like on the front end so the mentors are prepared for them. Uh, from a post-match training standpoint, we know there's more satisfying relationships and increased positive outcomes when there is advanced training, right? You don't just want to set something up at the beginning of the year and then think that the mentors are ready to go for the rest of the school year or community for the, for the year in full. Uh, and usually in advanced training, you can do uh, role plays, you can think of the challenges that came up, you can set goals for upcoming meetings, talk about curriculum, do some more skill development, how is the mentee, has the mentee been since the last meeting? These are really valuable things to do during post-match training. Uh, I'd like to mention to, to coordinators that peer mentors are going to make mistakes. Uh, youth make mistakes, adults make mistakes, and occasionally those mistakes are going to call into question their role in the program, and what my study showed is that programs are really handling this differently throughout the country, right? Some are having students sign contracts where they know that if they violate the expectation of the program, that to preserve the integrity of it, they're ultimately going to be removed. And there are other programs with a much more restorative justice approach who want to work with the peer mentors to reflect on what happened, to do some repair work with their mentee, to work with the other groups of peer mentors and figure out a way that maybe they're temporarily gone, but then they're brought back into the program and it's seen as a learning experience. I wouldn't suggest that one of those approaches is right and one of those approaches is wrong, but I do think there's value in sitting down on the front end and thinking through how you're going to handle it when these mistakes come up, because they're inevitable and you don't necessarily want to be caught in the middle of the situation trying to figure it out. So having some forethought on it and sharing it openly with the peer mentors is valuable during the training process. For program structure, the five areas I like to talk about briefly are outreach format, curriculum, match process, evaluation, and facilities. And to think through from an outreach format standpoint, the, the strengths, the challenges, and the solutions for, a, let's say, a one-to-one -one outreach. Uh, you know, in a one-to-one -one outreach model, which is the most common model you're going to see in mentoring programs, the major strength has to do with having these in-depth relationships that can develop, a trust that can be built up in that one-to-one -one setting. There's an openness there, and that really is the focus of mentoring connections and relationships. The structure lends itself nicely to that. From a challenges perspective, first of all, you might be limited by how many matches you can make. Because realistically, how many individual matches can you follow up on as a program coordinator? Uh, but you might also have a match that just doesn't gel well. And in that case, there's really no one else to go to if it's sort of mismatched in some way. Or even logistically, sometimes you've got a kid is sick uh, and they're not able to be there on a given day and you're needing to figure out then what happens to the mentee uh, in those moments. So from a solutions uh, perspective, we'd say really invest time in the match process, whether that's through a meet and greet beforehand or doing some sort of interest survey where you're able to ask the mentees, what is it that you really value in a peer mentor? What is it you would like? Uh, and then having a way to have backup mentors that are there. So in those moments where for whatever reason, the peer mentor doesn't make it, there's still someone for the mentee to connect with on, on those days. And you also need adequate adult coverage to make all of these individual matches. 
Uh, for group outreach, you know, some of the strengths is you really have a widespread reach, right? We're about to hear from the Center of Supportive Schools who will tell you about a program where they could have some of the biggest high schools in the country and have their entire ninth grade class have access to peer mentors in a group format with not that many adults needing to coordinate. Uh, it also provides some horizontal and vertical connections. So if, if the vertical connection is between the mentee and the peer mentor who's older, there's also some horizontal connections that can take place between the same age peers. And that allows for, you know, if you don't connect as much with the peer mentor, maybe you're still increasing school connectedness through uh, developing relationships with your classmates. Uh, from a challenges perspective, well, first of all, some people are really not comfortable opening up in groups. They could be more introverted. They could just not want to share. There could be a dynamic in the group you're not even aware of. You could have people in the group that were, that were dating previously, and you have no idea when they're put into the group, and suddenly it affects the dynamic. Uh, you also could have behavioral challenges in the group format. So we would suggest from a solution standpoint to really work on that group facilitation training for your peer mentors if you're in a group format. Maybe you need to add in a little bit more structure to the outreach uh, sessions. And then to think about, is there a way to get a one-to-one -one aspect included? Like we'll have students in some of these programs go to lunch periodically with, with kids in their group, you know, individually, or to go see them at a game or a performance and connect with them afterwards. So maybe there's a way it can become a little bit of a combination program. So the primary structure is in the group, but you're still building up that relationship one-on-one. -on -one. For standardized versus flexible curriculum, you know, usually programs do have some suggested areas or activities that they would recommend mentors cover, but we know that voice and choice is important. That the mentee should be actively involved in deciding what it is that they do, what it is that they talk about, and if a mentee ever comes in and is talking about this being the worst week of the year, you know, that is the curriculum, right? The fact that it's a relationship-based program means the mentors need to get trained to go with that strand above any sort of prescriptive agenda that maybe we have on the front end for them. Uh, I also just like to mention closing rituals. There's really, there's power in being able to model a healthy goodbye to reflect back and see what was special or meaningful or maybe one thing they would have liked to have seen changed. Uh, but to, to be able to do that in a mentoring connection is something that can be a life skill that we generally would recommend program coordinators thinking of as they think about the end of, of, of the year. For the match process, I won't talk much about it. We've already mentioned match a bit, but I will just say that match length and frequency of meetings do matter, right? So for these programs where they really are just focused on the beginning of a year, maybe there's some benefit to the transition that's happening there, but it doesn't really give the long-term effect that we would hope to see from a mentoring relationship. So figuring out a way to, to have those connections be somewhat consistent and to have a, a length of time uh, that generally is up, up to a year, or at least the school year, is, is really valuable. For program evaluation, uh, one of the, the experts that I interviewed says, you know, how do you measure the kid that gives the balloon to his sixth grader because his mom has cancer? You can't. How do you measure prevention? Every story that I hear like that, there are probably at least two or three stories of kids who are either going to commit suicide or were struggling and a peer mentor reached out, and we don't even know. So certainly, there's truth in the fact that we don't realize the impact that we're always having, and at times, the value of the mentoring relationship is really seen years after the fact. And there's a whole field dedicated to measuring these types of programs, and mentor does incredible work in this. So some of the solutions for program evaluation that, that we would recommend is to think through how are you going to have clearly specified program goals that you can consistently evaluate in order to enhance your program? You know, usually you've probably done a needs assessment to get it started. How are you meeting those needs? Uh, doing a pre and post model, right? So some survey before the program is implemented and afterwards is a great way to get some feedback on a manageable number of outcomes. And then using both quantitative and qualitative uh, descriptive narratives, interviews, surveys can be really, really valuable. Uh, I'd also suggest using data that the school or community already has access to. So you might have attendance records or grades or disciplinary referrals or graduation rates, participation in school activities. These are s 
some areas where there might be metrics there that you can use without having to do completely your own study, uh, in addition to some more of the qualitative uh, descriptions that you could receive, right? Any way you cut it, you need a way to track how the matches are going at any given time as a program coordinator. It's really important to have a consistent and updated uh, vision of what's happening within each match. For the importance of community and or school support, I would just say that sometimes, you know, people reported how a lack of community involvement can, can ruin a program. And so in thinking through how to bring some of the key players on board, you could uh, ask them to attend their own training, uh, to visit another school or community with a thriving program, or to participate on a stakeholder team. It's great to have an effective public relations plan. In fact, sometimes the program evaluation, in addition to helping you enhance your program from an objective standpoint, some of it can be used for PR. And especially if you can have any mentors or mentees speak to that value to administrators or boards or funders, that can be a really effective way of having them feel the impact of the work in addition to seeing the numbers behind it. Uh, for, for scheduling, which I just want to talk about for a moment, this is really a big one for school or community support. And we've already talked about the need for the program coordinators to have time, but they also need time to meet and train the peer mentors, and the peer mentors need time to meet with the mentees. So, you know, in a best case scenario, you're seeing classes in a school that are dedicated to this, and you're having a chance to have the outreach during that time slot. But if not classes, maybe there's advisory time or contact time or a homeroom or activities period. But if it's, it's always happening during after school when there's arts and there's sports, that can be really difficult. And as one coordinator said here, you know, my school refuses to structure regular meetings between student leaders and program coordinators, and as a result, we are ending our program. I cannot work with kids in 15-minute random lunch periods that, may attend, that they may attend with true effectiveness and credibility. So it is challenging logistically to figure out the scheduling on the front end, but it is well worth it in terms of how the program is perceived by the youth and the ability for them to connect on a regular basis. It really is a sign of support from the community to make that happen. Uh, just really briefly on facilities, you know, if it's a universal program, meaning you're going to be working with a full grade or a full group of students, you might have multiple locations you need at one time, so just to think through that. And then the, the proximity of adults, you know, it may be that you want to be able to uh, observe how the matches are going while they're happening without being directly into the space, so thinking about how you can make that work. Um, when you're launching or enhancing a program, the questions I think it's valuable to ask, you know, what type of program would you implement and why are you doing it based on your needs assessment? Who might be able to co-lead this program with you? Do you prefer a one-to-one -one or a group format and why? Are you looking for a universal or selective outreach and why? When are you going to be able to train the student leaders and when are they going to be able to meet with their mentees and where might these take place? So hopefully that's a helpful overview. Uh, you can always contact me further at joshbergeconsulting at gmail.com. And I'm looking forward to hearing out from our Center for Supportive Schools. Thanks, Josh. Um, I think that was an incredibly helpful overview. And this is going to be a really hard act to follow because um, Josh did such a great job of immersing us in the research and recommendations on, uh, of effective peer mentoring programs, um, but I'm going to try. So just to introduce myself, I'm Margot Ross. I'm the Managing Director of Communications and Development at the Center for Supportive Schools. And so now we're going to shift into learning about one model that is deeply grounded in the recommendations and the research that Josh has talked about. And so I think that you'll hear lots of alignment and consistencies um, in terms of what I'm going to offer and, and what we've already heard. Um, so this model has been implemented in schools across the country for 40 years, and it was developed and is implemented by my organization, which is the Center for Supportive Schools. So I'll just take a moment to introduce us. Um, our mission is to help schools become places where students want to be. And we do that in three primary ways. Um, and what we'll talk about today 
really falls into that first bucket of developing all students into leaders. Because for us, peer mentoring is very closely tied to student leadership, um, as well as student engagement and student voice and student agency. And so you'll hear, even as I discuss the peer mentoring program, that I'll use the term student leadership and peer leaders um, pretty often because our peer mentors are leaders in their schools. Um, the other buckets of work for us are empowering teachers to collaborate with each other and with students and engaging entire school communities to improve how learning happens. Um, as I said before, our experience with peer mentoring goes back 40 years. Um, we created our peer mentoring model, which is known as Peer Group Connection, or PGC, in 1979. And since then, we've partnered with over 200 schools to put that model into place, and over 45,000 students are impacted by PGC every year. Um, so what is Peer Group Connection? What is PGC? Uh, it's a peer-to-peer -peer group mentoring model that trains and mobilizes older students to help ease the transition into school for incoming students and improve school culture and climate, um, as well as many other social, emotional, and academic outcomes for students. There are two versions of PGC. One is for high schools and one is for middle schools. In the high school model, 11th and 12th graders are trained to support 9th graders as mentors. And in middle school, 8th um, graders are trained as mentors to support 6th graders. And each model has its own curriculum. Um, but the structure of the model are the same. And so we'll take a look now at that structure. And what I offer here is a visual representation of that. Um, I'm just gonna focus on using high school language just to make it cleaner, but the structure is the same if this were to be implemented with middle grades as well. So I'm actually gonna start from the bottom. Um, and as Josh talked about, um, universal program. PGC is a universal program, meaning that if you are a ninth grader in a PGC school, you are automatically going to be enrolled into a peer group. And that's what these little green ovals at the bottom represent. So you will be assigned to a group of other ninth graders, um, anywhere from 10 to 14 of them. And that group will meet once per week with a pair of peer mentors. And so on this structure, the peer mentors are represented by that line of little blue people there. Um, and so each one of these peer groups uh, consists of two peer mentors, and as I said, 10 to 14 ninth graders. And that group stays consistent um, and meets once per week for the entire ninth grade year. Um, and so what the peer mentors are doing with the ninth graders is uh, facilitating, utilizing a structured curriculum, facilitating engaging hands-on activities that are designed to help build relationships among the group, both same age and cross age, um, and also to help enhance and give an opportunity for students to practice social, emotional, and academic the way that the peer mentors are trained to do this work is through a daily course for credit. Um, and that course is offered as part of the regular school day. So PGC is embedded into the regular school day as a part of the fabric of the school and not as an after school program. So you've got, as we're moving up this figure, you've got your peer mentors enrolled in a daily course for credit. And in that course, they are learning all of the mentoring and leadership and facilitation skills that they need in order to be effective peer mentors and group facilitators for younger students. And Josh talked about the importance of that training. And so for us, um, you know, we, we do believe that that's critically important. And so we ensure that the peer mentors are receiving four days of training for every one day that they're working with their 
um, mentees, and that ratio is really important. That course is team taught by a team of two faculty advisors. We call them faculty advisors, same thing as the program coordinators that Josh was referring to. Um, so these faculty advisors are trained by CSS and they get trained through an 11 day training course that happens over the course of about a year and a half to two years. So they have a structured curriculum that they are using to help train the peer mentors to serve in their role. And moving all the way up to the top, um, Josh also talked about uh, the importance of stakeholder teams for overcoming um, challenges and implementation and uh, sustainability. And that is critically important for us. If we are going to launch a new PGC program in a school in September, we start working with that school six to nine months in advance to establish their stakeholder team. Um, and that team is a diverse group of administrators, faculty, parents, and students, um, key decision makers, it includes the principal, it includes the school scheduler. These are folks that need to be bought in to the program and need to be deeply invested in its um, successful implementation and stability. So if we move on, um, you know, when you think about this model, it's not easy to implement. Um, it's certainly a heavy lift and it's certainly something that schools need to think carefully about and invest resources into implementing uh, properly. So what I've highlighted here are just some common challenges that we hear from schools when they are about to embark um, upon implementing PGC. And those fall into two really common categories, resources and scheduling. Um, so resources, human resources are always a challenge in schools because PGC does require two school-based adults to team teach the daily course. Um, that can be hard sometimes for schools to identify the right advisors um, to lead the program. We think it's incredibly important both for program sustainability as Josh talked about, um, also for peer-to-peer -peer support between the advisors and the fact that they are able to model co-facilitation, which is important for the peer mentors to see because they will be co-facilitating their mentoring activities with their mentees. So this is an essential part of implementing this program with Fidelity. And we work really closely with schools to help figure out who the right people are um, and how to make sure that they are available to team teach the course. Um, one of these folks does need to be a certified teacher because this is a course for credit, but it can ease the burden a little bit on schools if the other adult is not a certified teacher and is maybe another member of the support staff in the school and has a little bit more of a flexible schedule. But that's part of that six to nine month planning process that we do with stakeholders to really help figure out who the best choices are to serve as advisors. Um, and then, of course, money is another resource that can be hard to come by in schools. Um, this program does require a one-time program fee of $60,000 per school. And what that provides uh, is the 11-day training course for the advisors, the full curriculum, on-site technical assistance. Um, and so we work very closely with schools to help identify grant funding, to help schools tap into their Title I funding, um, and to help un, you know, key decision makers understand the return on this investment if the program is implemented with fidelity over the long term, each cohort of new ninth graders um, becomes part of PGC every year, but there are not additional investments um, into program fees. It's a one-time fee. So the cost per student goes down every year that the program is implemented. And so that's, you know, a good argument for why it's important to plan for long-term sustainability at the front end. Scheduling is another challenge um, because PGC is part of the regular school schedule. It can be hard to carve out the appropriate amount of time for the course for credit um, so that your peer mentors are getting 
the full training and also to make the time available for the mentoring session. Um, it's one of the reasons why we strongly recommend that the school scheduler is a member of the stakeholder team. And this is, again, something that we work with stakeholders on, um, figuring out is there a way to attach PGC to an advisory model? Can we tap into health and PE classes? Can we utilize homeroom and lunch periods? Um, and so we found lots of creative ways to overcome that challenge. But what's most important is that the frequency and the dosage of the program remain um, you know, up to the standards of the model so that the program is being implemented with fidelity. But all that to say, um, when these challenges are overcome and the model is implemented as it's supposed to be, you can expect some pretty um, remarkable impacts. And so I'll just spend a couple of minutes taking a look at some of the research related to PGC and the impact that we have seen it have. Um, starting with attendance, um, Westat did an independent study of PGC in 32 high schools in Baltimore, New York City, and rural North Carolina over two years and found that ninth grade students and peer leaders who participated in PGC attended school significantly more than non-participants and the increased attendance rates were sustained a full year after students completed PGC. And I find um, uh, results like this pretty remarkable for the ninth graders because these students are only receiving the peer mentoring for one period per week. Now it is remaining consistent over the course of the entire year, but one period per week to get a significant result um, as it relates to attendance is pretty remarkable and I think speaks to the power of the peer mentoring relationship when it is implemented correctly. Um, moving on, some more results from that Westat study. Um, ninth graders who participated in PGC were on track to graduate on time, more so than non-participants. That finding was also sustained into 10th grade. And ninth grade students and peer leaders um, also exhibited a higher grade point average than non-participants. And then we've also seen um, an impact of PGC on graduation. And again, now we're taking um, an intervention that happens one time per week in the ninth grade and seeing results that persist four years later to high school graduation, which again, I think is pretty remarkable. Um, so this study was conducted, this was a longitudinal study that was conducted in um, an urban high school in New Jersey. And you can see that the control group's graduation rates at 68% and 63% um, are not as high as we would like to see. And the um, graduation rates of the program group, uh, when we look at all students and male students at 77% and 81%, you know, we'd also love to see higher graduation rates there, but it's the increase um, that is what's so incredible. And so we have a nine percentage point increase um, between the control group and the program group among all students and an 18 percentage point increase in graduation rates for male students. So, you know, we really believe that peer mentoring or, you know, a model like PGC can be an essential ingredient in school improvement efforts. So this last slide just, I think, really brings things full circle um, and, again, repeats much of what Josh has offered, a cross-age peer mentoring relationship is a powerful form of youth development, but should not be left to its own devices. We know that peer mentors need support from adults. We know that they need training and supervision and guidance. And so that's why it's so important that if you're going to embark upon putting a peer mentoring model into place in your school, that it is grounded in these evidence-based practices and strategies that we have discussed. Um, and that, you know, if you invest in a proven model, that will help ensure that, you know, you're going to see the impact that you're hoping for and there will be a return on that investment and that, um, you know, you will be doing more good than harm for sure 
um, because you have thought through all of the considerations and asked yourself all of those key questions that Josh already highlighted for us. Um, so now I think we're moving into the most exciting part of the webinar, and that's getting to hear directly from the experts who are doing this work in their schools every day. Um, I'm so excited that we have our PGC representatives from Western High School in Baltimore, Maryland with us. And Western is one of 31 schools in Baltimore City that is implementing PGC. So I'm really thrilled that they can join us and uh, speak firsthand about their experiences with this peer mentoring model. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Anitra um, to move us along. Thank you. So we at Western High School are really lucky to have this program because it really fits very well with kind of the basic threads of our school. Um, we are an all girls public high school and we currently have about 1100 students. We are a college preparatory high school. So each year we have about 90% of our students moving on directly to two or four year colleges. And um, PGC gives us an opportunity to really embed some of these college going skills and life skills and SEL skills to our ninth graders to help them become even more successful. This is our second year of implementation. Last year, we had 41 PGC leaders, um, probably about 70% 12th graders, another 30% 11th graders, and we've had five of our 11th grade PGC leaders return for their 12th grade year. Uh, this year, we have over 300 freshmen, and we have another large group of PGC leaders split among two sections of the course. And so our PG, PGC class happens for our leaders twice a week, I mean, twice during the day. And so um, those students are together all year long, every day, still following the same model of um, kind of the five step outreach process. However, the big difference for us is that our students meet bi weekly. That works well for our school because we are, um, we have a pretty heavy academic day as well as lots of other activities that happen in our building and so bi-weekly allowed for us to still be able to touch students quite often and to have some great impacts on them. Our current freshmen um, have participated are about to participate in their activity day which is a um, day that gives them a chance to do multiple outreaches in one session and we are really looking forward to seeing not only how these types of programs impact the students, but also, I'm sorry, impact the ninth graders, but also our 11th and 12th graders. We saw great strides in our PGC mentor students. They did really, really well. They grew in their public speaking. They grew in their self-confidence. They grew in being able to diffuse situations in the building and their leadership skills. And you can see in our rising 10th graders, that now they are looking forward to becoming PGC mentors themselves. So um, I am going to hand it over to one of our returning mentors. Um, Regietta is a 12th grader with us and she's gonna tell us a little bit about her PGC experience. Um, so when it comes to PGC, the most meaningful moments for me were like the end, knowing that we were able to like touch every um, girl and make an impact on them. Like it also like set them up for the rest of the year. So they all build up a lot of confidence. What made me really proud is that a lot of the girls who were like, you know, not willing to like open up and everything, they opened up a lot and they also grew in their like leadership skills, being able to put themselves out there, um, get into extracurricular activities and like be like a part of our um, Western family. Some of the challenges that I have faced while being a PGC group, um, while being in PGC would be like making sure that I touch all the girls and making sure that um, they, they are, they're excited about it. Like they're not just here and not just, you know, just not just participating, but, um, but making sure that they're involved and more like just making sure that they're more excited about what comes with PGC. Um, what I've noticed about our school is that 
Um, a lot of the girls are involved. Um, most of them come to school every day. We have a really high attendance rate. Um, we also put up like these bullying signs last year and it, it impacted a lot of the girls. It touched them. They were able to open up about their experiences and help out other girls. And so we also had um, two, we've had two full day occurrences with the girls as in outside of their even kind of bi-weekly meetings. And so kind of some of the images you see here, one is, an individual group. And so all of their sessions take place in small group settings. And then for some of these, the larger full day activities, we're able to gather groups together to kind of do some additional interactions with them there. And so that's kind of our experience over the past two years. It's been a really fast, but very rewarding two years for us. And we think that you know, given more time, we're able to build these relationships more, we're able to build the skills in our students more, and we'll see an even greater return on what we're putting into them at this stage. All right, great. Well, thank you all so much. We are um, at our question and answering stage and want to thank all four of our wonderful panelists today uh, by bringing in some of their uh, expertise around peer mentoring and uh, want to kind of hear from you all. And I'm going to turn it on over to many um, so that we can see if there are any questions from the audience. Thanks, Desiree. This is Minnie. I'm um, calling in from Mentor here. It's just moderating the question box. So we're just still waiting for a few more questions. So if you all have any questions or just thoughts, comments, definitely type them in. I'm really excited to hear what you all have to say. Um, we do have one question right now currently. I think this is directed more towards um, Josh and your presentation. Um, the question was, how is mentoring program quality defined or measured vis-a-vis evidence-based practices? I think they're kind of looking at terms of kind of program quality measurements. And if you had any thoughts on that. So it can vary by program depending on what their needs assessment has said when they're starting it, right? So different programs might have different outcomes they're looking to find and therefore the evaluation would be tailored specifically to it. I think a lot of the research that you'll find with uh, Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America are uh, focused on areas related to school connectedness, related to self-esteem. And if you look again at uh, Michael Karcher's research that I recommended, he'll suggest there in the handbook of youth mentoring, some different scales and pre-existing surveys that you might be able to use depending on what your desired program outcome is that have shown to be effective from an evidence-based standpoint of an effective way to, to get measurement. Great. Thank you. And then if we have another question here. Um, I think they're asking, I think any of you all can speak on this kind of how as a supervisor, um, how, what are some strategies for best supporting the peer mentors, especially with kind of scheduling and youth, um, youth, they have a lot of different things going on in their lives, kind of what are some best tips for kind of supporting the mentors as young people as they're kind of experiencing things in their own lives? Um, I can take it if, if you would like, or I can chime in. Um, I think one of the things for us at Western is we really attempted to kind of meet them where they are. It worked out well that PGC was designed for 11th and 12th grade students. And so as we began to look at the types of classes students were taking in places where, you know, we would have a combination of all types of students interested in the program, we didn't lay it out as if it was just another academic opportunity or as if it was just another, you know, elective course. We really tried to give all of the facets of the program to them so that they could then make a good decision about whether or not it was a good fit. The way that the interview process works also really help for students to get a feel for what they would be doing. And so I think when you're considering all of the, you know, things that happen in a teenager's life and trying to decide if they want to get involved in something, it really is 
helping them to look at all of the responsibilities and all the pieces of their role first, and then working to make sure that you're meeting, you know, their true needs um, before just throwing them into an opportunity. Because just because it sounds great doesn't mean that it's going to work out for every student. And so you really want to cover as many bases as you can and kind of front load things so that they have a clear understanding of what they're getting themselves into. And, and just to, to follow up on that, sometimes the youth that you think would be great for something are already involved in so many different activities that you could potentially do well to find the students that are really committed to this specific type of program. And being really approachable as a program coordinator is important for them to be able to share honestly about how, how they're doing. And I think getting feedback from the peer mentors regularly, I'm thinking of one program that I'm working with right now, where they were supposed to schedule the individual lunches. It was a one-to-one -one program for new students coming into a school, and they were supposed to do it on their own. And they said, you know, it would really be helpful if at least once a month you set up, you provided the lunch, you set up the time, you scheduled it, and then we'll schedule the additional meetings throughout the month, whether we're going to do an activity together or connect. But if the program could set that up for us, that would be helpful. And so being open to that feedback and hearing what they're recommending, I think, is useful as well. Great, thank you all. Um, this is kind of a PGC specific question. Um, I don't know if Margo, you want to speak on this kind of what was the reasoning behind having co peer mentors um, and kind of how, um, kind of what goes into that? Sure. Um, so I think that, you know, having to, and I think Anitra, um, you know, may also want to speak to this and your experiences running the program. But, you know, there's a built in peer to peer support there for the peer mentors. So obviously the peer mentors are trained in a group setting um, because they are involved as a group in the peer leadership class. Um, but then when they work together, um, they can support one another, they complement one another. Um, there's a pretty extensive process that the groups go through in order to assign co-leaders. And so in a co-ed high school, for example, you would have one male and one female um, as part of that co-mentoring team. Um, and you'd also want to have students who really complement one another, both in terms of their skills, um, but, you know, kind of their personalities, what they bring to the table, how other students perceive them, because if they're working with a group of 10 to 15 ninth graders, um, you want those ninth graders to really be able to relate to their peer mentors. And so, you know, if they are, you know, if you're a young man uh, in the ninth grade group, maybe you'll relate more to a male mentor, but then having a female mentor um, brings something different to the table that you might not have anticipated. Um, so, you know, I think both the peer-to-peer -peer support, um, some of what Josh talked about in terms of, you know, if something comes up, then for example, somebody can't be there for some reason, um, it doesn't really um, impact the continuity or the consistency of the mentoring sessions because there's another um, mentor who can continue to work with the group and who knows the group really well. Um, and then also being able to complement one another and bring different things to the table so that the mentees find something um, that they can connect with, um, hopefully in both of their mentors and also seeing the way that they work together but certainly um, that, you know, that there's at least one person there who they feel a deep connection with um, and you know, the impact that that has on the relationship and their sense of connectedness to the group and to school. Great, thank you, Margo. So this question I think would be best directed to Ragieta um, as our peer um, leader. So I'd love to hear more about kind of the training process that you went through to become a peer mentor and kind of what training or activities have um, been most effective to you to help prepare you as a mentor. And if um, any of the PGC representatives also want to speak on the training process the mentors go through, I'd love to I think the audience would love to hear more about that. Um, when it comes to like 
um, connecting, we did the retreat, the three-day retreat, and that helped us a lot because a lot of us either didn't speak to each other in school or just seen each other. So being able to like connect and sit in the circle, the circle really helps because you're really facing everyone and being able to like really connect with them. Um, one of the activities we got to pick out an item and share the item. And when we were like sharing the item, we all really got emotional. So after that, the next day when we went to school, we all just like, we had a lot of love for each other. And it just really showed that we're gonna like really connect throughout the year. And like the PGC is gonna be like a really good year for us. And so they participate in a three day retreat where they um, participate in activities that are both skill building and group bonding. Um, and so CSS does a really good job of laying out those activities for us in a specific sequence. So at no point is anybody really kind of becoming way too invasive or you know too close kind of too quickly. And they're also able to really work on those facilitation skills without even realizing it. So, you know, the the sharing activity that Ragietta is referring to is the last night of the three-day retreat and it allows for students to pick any item it could be you know a keychain or a photo or something and they bring the item and they talk about it and for many of them it's the first time that they actually think about the true value of this thing and so it not only allows for them to practice speaking to a group but you're speaking about a personal experience and you're sharing those things about yourself with a group of virtual, you know, no longer are you strangers, but now you're creating an even deeper bond. And so that type of well scaffolded um, team building really allows for the peer mentors to improve their facilitation skills, public speaking skills, and to work on their own kind of social emotional growth and you know creating the bonds within the group um, in a very safe way. And so I, for both of us, that three-day retreat is kind of critical to their training. Great, and to follow up on that are the mentor trainings as well as kind of the mentor-mentee activities designed by um, PGC or is it something on a school-by-school -school basis that you all create? We work from the um, CSS curriculum for PGC. And so there are, it's, being in an all girls school, there are some tweaks that we have to make every once in a while to some of the activities, just because some of the scenarios may not apply in our school and things like that. But otherwise, you know, we've been given a great set of resources from them. And so it works really well for our school. Thank you. So we have some more good questions coming in. Um, so we have more of a research focused question here. Um, this person has asked, we feel challenged um, when doing control groups. How do you design and implement the control group research and make the students who are not in the program feel comfortable participating in the research? So that can be a challenge from the perspective of who your target group is, but if you're wanting it to be a universal program and you're not getting everyone into it, students are going to wonder well, why am I included or I'm not included. That's where uh, community-based organizations might be able to do that more successfully, where there are certain students they may not even know they're having an additional uh, mentoring component to a program that another group might not. Uh, it's always helpful to have, when possible, outside evaluators or researchers come in from who can bring that objectivity and some of that uh, professional expertise so you're not stuck as the coordinator in the position of on one hand, I'm trying to promote and build my program, and on from the other perspective, I'm really trying to get an objective sense as to what the actual impact is. And so I'd recommend, when possible, to try and design that with some additional you know, outside experts and to think through, like you're saying, what is the additional component for the study that you're doing, and do you feel ethically that it's the right thing to do as far as the services you're able to provide to one group and, and then not to another? Thank you, Josh. I have another question on a topic that kind of we haven't really covered um, in this webinar, but I want to hear if you all have any advice or insights for doing near peer mentoring programs between college students and high school upperclassmen to support them with post secondary planning.
so I'll, I'll just jump in. Uh, it, it can be challenging from a scheduling standpoint with a school-based program to find consistent time for that to be able to work. But we do know how important college persistence is, and sometimes having that connect with someone who's already going through it is extremely valuable. Uh, sometimes I've seen partnerships with certain colleges or universities that are local whereby there can be some return trips that happen to both campuses, and there's forms of e-mentoring that can take place too, where you're using Skype sessions and being able to talk if you're not always able to be in person. And in those cases, I just think that the question really becomes, what is the desired focus of the program? Is it to build that relationship and to build that connection, or is there also some goals that are in mind with regards to uh, helping students anticipate what they might be facing the following year in college, where maybe it's not just relationship focused, where there's actual some tangible skill building and some exposure to resources that are out there where they can learn how to take advantage of them that can be really helpful. Thank you. Um, another question, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, so send them in if you still have do you all still have any other questions? But kind of what um, important piece of advice or one important recommendation would you have um, for schools who are looking to, to begin implementing a peer mentoring program? Um, how do you really get that buy-in from school administrators and making sure you find the re right resources? And any of you can answer. I can speak a little bit about how we, so for us, that's been kind of an ongoing, it's not really an issue because we have some school administration buy-in, but it's really hard, like full school, it helps if the whole school has an understanding of the impacts on the entire school. Our, although PGC happens with ninth graders and 11th and 12th graders are leading it, and it's a very small group of 11th and 12th graders, it is more effective when the entire building understands. And so we've done some full school presentations. We're actually looking to do some more, you know, even if it's having the peer leaders come in and do act, lead a couple activities for the school staff so that they can even see what that does for their relationships. Um, it makes a really big difference. Administrators need to really, again, I think somebody else had mentioned this, you know, just kind of seeing what is going to be the return on their investment. And so if I'm a principal and I've been struggling with attendance, you know, I, I have to truly believe that by holding these sessions and, you know, maybe changing some things related to instructional time, that it's going to have that good impact on my attendance. Um, it really is one of those things that if someone doesn't, um, isn't just open to the process, then it's really not going to work. A lot of it is, Last year for us was, we're just gonna do this with fidelity. Our principal said, yep, just, we're, we're gonna try it with, you know, do it with fidelity and just trusted, you know, there was a lot of pushback because at times it would be, I'd rather have them go to class than have this session. And as the stakeholder coordinator, I had to just remind her, we're doing this with fidelity this year. And so, you know, just again, to kind of be willing to have that kind of back and forth and to be willing to have, you know, our PTA support us and things like that. It really is, that's the biggest piece is just for all of the individuals involved in the school to experience what it is like and to have a big, and to keep the bigger picture in mind at all times. I also Thank really like when there's, an when there's an opportunity to be able to bring in both research, showing the administrators this is a documented effect that it's had, and to have some personal experience where you've contacted a local school that's running a similar program and the administrator there or the students there can speak to it, can be really powerful. And I also think it's great, you're gonna know the priorities of your given community. And oftentimes the positive outcomes for these mentoring programs are very much in alignment with whatever the priorities are for your respective community. And so if you can tie in how the program potentially is going to benefit exactly the areas that the administrators or the funders are really concerned with, that also can be a pretty compelling selling point to get started. Great, thank you so much. And then just the last question, I'll direct it to Ragietta, um, just as our peer mentor on the webinar today, kind of if you could give, um, just talking to other 
mentoring programs or just other folks who are looking to start a peer mentoring program, kind of what would what advice would you give them in how they can strengthen their peer mentoring program or why they should start a mentoring program? Um, I would give advice saying that you should definitely be open to things. You shouldn't be closed out because it's not only going to impact you, but it's also going to impact the, the community of your school. So I would just make sure that you know that you're going to be committed to this, that this is a part of your life and that you have a lot of other people watching your moves. Okay, well, thank you all so much. I think this is all for our Q&A. However, um, if folks want to reach out to our presenters today with more questions that we didn't get to, feel free to reach them out. So I'll pass it off to just Desiree to kind of close us out. Thank you all. Great. We have our next slide. All right. Um, so we have some wonderful uh, National Mentoring Resource Center resources, which you can find it on our on the website, which is www.nationalmentoringresourcecenter.org on peer mentoring. And um, again, you will receive these slides, so the links will be inside of those. And if you'd like some additional resources, we have a wonderful team of affiliates across the um, uh, nation. And there are Clearinghouse for Training Resources, Public Awareness and Advocacy. And there is a link for that as well for you to find out how to get more information. We have the Mentoring Connector. If you'd like to be able to um, put your program inside of the only um, national database for mentoring. And of course, again, um, we are funded by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention check out their website and also the National Mentoring Resource Center website, which is a no-cost evidence-based mentoring um, site. So just remember, after the webinar, please help us out by answering survey questions, and everyone will get an email with information on how to download the slides, uh, hear the recording, and have resources on the CMWS webpage on the mentor website, which is below. And also stay connected. Um, you can email us. The website is there. You can tweet with the hashtag um, mentoring webinar and visit our webpage on the mentor website for past and upcoming webinars over the last few years. And join us next month for mentoring and social emotional learning. Um, always, uh, unless there is a uh, conflict with the holiday, our webinars are on the third Thursday, uh, which will be November 21st, 2019. Sign up today.